<laughs> All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Birch Aquarium's live kelp cam stream. My name is Caitlin. You have seen me here many times before, but we have another special guest this, guest this morning, the other Birch Aquarium, Caitlin. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Hello. So um, this morning you get double Caitlin's to talk all about our giant kelp forest. So uh, Caitlin, can you introduce yourself a little bit and tell us a little bit more about what you do at the aquarium? Yeah, my name is Caitlin. <laughs> uh, I'm an interpreter at the aquarium, which just means that I interpret the science and the stories of Birch Aquarium to make it fun and interesting for the public. And I'm very excited to be here today. Yay! Well, we're so excited to have you, and I'm really excited, too, because I know that that the interpreters at the aquarium, if anyone has visited, you might have run into Caitlin or some of our other interpreters around. Expand your visit. So if you have a question about the sea turtle or a question about the giant kelp forest, they're there for you. So, Caitlin, we're stoked to hear what you have to say about our giant kelp forest. So let's see. I know we're going to pull up that stream in just a second. Oh, it's looking good this morning. Some beautiful light. I live inland of La Jolla and I can see from a distance that it's it's sunny down down in La Jolla so I'm happy that our giant kelp is getting plenty of light. Um, Caitlin do you want to tell us any anything you like about this exhibit or any fun facts you know about our giant kelp forest exhibit? Yeah I'm actually really excited because there is kelp in the kelp forest yeah. so I know in the last week or so I guess they got permission to get more kelp which is really awesome. Mm -hmm. So kelp itself is one of my favorite things because it's it's not a plant, it's not an animal, it's like an algae. And the algae, um, a giant kelp can grow like a hundred feet. So, and in certain conditions can grow almost two feet a day. So it's, as you can see, the waves are kind of pushing it around. So it does really well in very wavy environments, really cold environments. Um, and that's because there's a lot of nutrients in those environments. Yeah, and, and what's really cool is, I know we've talked about it a few times, but the water in our giant kelp forest exhibit is brought in from the ocean. So there's a big pump at the end of Scripps Oceanography's research pier, which is located at La Jolla Shores Beach. And that water is brought up from La Jolla Shores and is used in the research laboratories at Scripps Oceanography, as well as many of our exhibits here at Birch Aquarium. So our kelp is getting a lot of nutrients. And actually this time of year is really good for giant kelp because it is the spring plankton bloom, which means there's a lot of micronutrients in the water, which is healthy for plankton that allows plankton to explode and grow because of those nutrients. And then also the days are getting longer, which means more light for photosynthesis for our kelp. So that way it can grow those two feet, uh, like Caitlin was telling you. Anyway, it looks like we have a few people saying hello this morning. Hi, Allison. We're happy to see the giant black sea bass is your favorite. She's definitely a crowd crowd favorite. Uh, Caitlin, can you tell us anything about that cool giant black sea bass? Yeah, so um, that giant black sea bass is a, an endangered species. It's a protected species. It's amazing. And we're really excited that we have her. She's been with us since the aquarium opened and she weighs about 300 pounds. And what's incredible about that is that she can grow even larger. So I think the largest specimen um, ever captured was um, closer to like 600 pounds. So that's yeah, pretty really amazing. Big. They can get really big. <laughs> and you can see she really likes to be up at the top. Um, but my favorite thing is sometimes when, you know, there's it's not very crowded or um, sometimes in the morning, she'll go down to the bottom left hand rock and she likes to scratch herself on it. So that's really cool to see. It is super cool. And if you guys tune in on the kelp cam earlier in the morning or a little bit later in the evening, we, we run a feed overnight so that you guys can actually see the kelp cam um, since at night it is dark in this exhibit. But uh, if you tune in early in the morning or uh, like maybe around six, early seven, uh, you might actually get to see the giant black sea bass coming down a little bit more. Definitely in the evenings and at night she comes down a little bit more. Hi there. Oh my goodness. Kristen asked us to say hi to Autumn, who is seven, tuning in from San Diego. Hello, hello, Autumn. Hi, Autumn. We're so glad you were able to tune into the giant kelp forest with us. And what I want to know is maybe, Autumn, you can help us spot there is a Maury eel taking a nap 
at the bottom of the exhibit on the left-hand side. I wish I could point to it for you. But can you guys spot that Maury eel that's taking a nap kind of down there on the left? I don't know. Do you see it, Caitlin? Yeah, I, I think yeah. I do. Yeah. yeah. They spend a lot of time resting, especially during the day, and they like to find little caves or crevices to hide themselves in, or sometimes they'll even tangle themselves up in the kelp and just kind of hang out. Oh, it's really cool. And some people actually, when the aquarium is open, they will come and find someone like Caitlin, one of the interpreters or some of our volunteers and say, the eel is stuck in the kelp. We need to help the eel, the eel is stuck. And we say, thank you for letting us know. But the eels actually like to wrap themselves up in the kelp at times so they don't drift away when they're taking naps. I yeah, they have like really kind of like mucusy, right slimy skin. So they can, they can kind of wiggle their way into really tight crevices and be totally fine. Yeah. And I think we have four eels in this exhibit, three eels in this exhibit, about that I'm many. Not sure. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but those would... eels are some of the oldest animals we have at the aquarium in that they've been with us since the original Scripps Aquarium that was located down the hill at Scripps Oceanography. So these eels are more than 30 years old, which is really cool. Yeah, Caitlin, do you have anything else you want to add about the eels? Um, eels are really awesome. So the, the California moray eel is actually the only species we have locally, um, which is really exciting because sometimes if you're snorkeling or diving, you get a chance to see them. What's really awesome about eels um, is that they don't have like the gill covers. They're like called a perculum for fish. And so they constantly kind of look like they're talking at you because they have to open and close their mouths all the time to be able to continue like pushing water over their gills. So that's a really cool. Yeah, some people think it can look kind of menacing because you can see their teeth, but they're just taking some deep breaths. And so it's really, really cool to see. And we have another exhibit uh, within the Hall of Fishes where you can get kind of nose to nose with those moray eels and see that. One of my favorite things about the morays is that they have teeny tiny eyeballs. They're really small. And that means they don't have the best eyesight, especially when they're down deep in the water and looking around for food around the rocky reef and the rocky bottom. However, they do have a great sense of smell and they have six nostrils to help them smell and find their food. So I think if either one of us, Caitlin's had six nostrils, we'd be able to sniff out something to eat. <laughs> Really fun. Uh, Tracy is is asking on behalf of Benjamin. Who what actually happens is you can actually see it right here at our kelp cam is that after kelp reaches the top of the water, it kind of starts flowing over the top of it and expanding outward that way. So kelp has a really flexible stipe, which is kind of like a stalk or like what like a twig would be like. Um, and it's really flexible. So as it as it grows up to the top, it kind of just keeps growing and bending over. And it also kelp has these little gas bladders that help um, it stay afloat in the water. And so the gas bladders continue just helping it float along the top of the water. So it doesn't go out of the top, but just kind of floats along the top once um, it reaches that height. Yeah, that's a really great question, Benjamin. I don't think we've gotten that question before. And the fact that the kelp is close to the surface of the water is also really good because it likes to do photosynthesis or make food for itself from the sunlight and the nutrients in the water. So the closer the kelp can get to the surface of the water, the more sunlight it can have to do that photosynthesis and make food. That's really cool. Let's see, we also have Abigail and Nolan from Boise, Idaho. They're tuning in again. Hi, you guys. I feel like I'm recognizing a bunch of people. <laughs> we do this a few times a week. Thank you guys for your support and for tuning in. Let's see, we had a Garibaldi question that I saw. Autumn, who we said hello to before, hello again, Autumn, wants to know why the Garibaldi are found in the kelp forests. Um, so Garibaldi are really awesome. They're the California state fish. Um, and sometimes they can be seen along like the, the rocky coast. So you can see them a little bit other places, but they like the kelp forest because it makes a really good home for them. So they'll build their nest, the, the daddies, the males, they build their nests um, at the bottom of the kelp and they kind of will guard it. So they're this bright orange color, which is like warning color to tell other fish kind of to stay away because they can be kind of grouchy fish. Um, and they've even been known to kind of come up and peck at like divers or snorkelers who get too close to them. And so they like the kelp forest because it provides a lot of protection, a little bit of privacy, and it makes a really good place for them to have their nests. 
Yeah, it's a really great home for those Garibaldis. And if anyone um, has ever been walking along La Jolla Shore, or not La Jolla Shore, excuse me, by La Jolla Cove and the children's pool in La Jolla, there the kelp forest is very close to the shore. And what's really neat is sometimes you can actually see the Garibaldi from the land there. So when we're all able to go back out to the parks, make sure you keep an eye out because you don't even need a snorkel to see the Garibaldis by La Jolla Cove a lot of the time. Have you ever spotted them from shore there, Caitlin? Maybe we Yeah, can. I have, um, especially from like up on top of the cliffs. You look down and then suddenly they're really cranky. So a lot of fish will be brightly colored because um, they're poisonous or venomous and they just want to tell others to stay away. Now Garibaldi, aren't venomous or poisonous. They just kind of are kind of cranky and they want to be left alone. And so their bright orange should kind of tell other fish just to stay away. There's a male Garibaldi in the front of the exhibit. Right now you can see him kind of on the bottom right. And what he is doing is grooming his algae patch, which is the place he hopes the female or the mama Garibaldis will come and lay her eggs. And we actually posted a video over the weekend of our aquarist, Vince. He is one of the people who helps take care of our animals. And he was scuba diving in this exhibit and was actually collecting the Garibaldi eggs. When the baby Garibaldis hatch out of the eggs, they are teeny, teeny, tiny. They're less than a half an inch long. And they are like a grain of rice or a skinny grain of rice. I don't know, Caitlin, have you seen those little baby Garibaldis right when yeah, they get them? They're, they're so really small. cute. <laughs> they're really cute and super small. And so if we just let them hatch in this exhibit, they, they would not survive. Not only would they be snacks for the other animals, the filtration system in this exhibit is really not set up for fish of, of that teeny, tiny size. So... Aquarius Vince goes in and collects the eggs so we can put them in a special exhibit behind the scenes so that we can grow them up and hopefully more baby Garibaldis to have on display here at Birch Aquarium in the future. And then also share those baby Garibaldis with aquariums in the region. Uh, they don't have to take any Garibaldis out of the wild. So it's a really fun thing. And I don't know if anybody who has seen that video can maybe give us a spoiler for what one of our aquarists' favorite tools might be that they actually use for many, many different things, even though we might only use that tool on one specific holiday per year. So let's see if anybody in the comments can, can tell us which that fun tool is. I don't know, Caitlin, sometimes you help out behind the scenes. Have you ever yeah. used that secret tool when helping? <laughs> the super special tool. <laughs> It is a secret. I'm not going to tell you guys what it is yet. Let's see. Uh, let's see. So um, Sarah is asking on behalf of Jackson in Desert Hot Springs, which is here in Southern California. Um, hi, Jackson. How did the fish get into this tank? Well, there's a few different ways, but <laughs> let's see. Caitlin, do you want to talk a little bit about, about where these fish might come from? Yeah, sure. So um, like you mentioned earlier, sometimes we hatch our own fish, which is really awesome. It's a great way for us to make sure that the animals we're getting are, you know, super healthy. We know where they came from. We we know who they came from sometimes, um, which is really fun. And it's also fun just to get to see the babies grow up, which is really cool. And then when they get big enough, um, they can be put into tanks like this one. We also will get fish from other aquariums sometimes. So um, we are AZA, so the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. So sometimes we share with other aquariums and sometimes they share with us. So that's really awesome as well. And then to get into the tank, um, when we do get fish, we do have to have like a period of time where they're just kind of ch chilling out so we can make sure that they're nice and happy and healthy enough to go into the tanks. And then there's no top on this tank. So, um, you know, it's pretty easy to see how maybe they would get into the tank once they're ready. Yeah, exactly. So with having no top on the top of this exhibit, it makes it easy for our aquarists to add new animals in. However, sometimes it can be a little bit of a challenge if you need to take them out uh, <laughs> because the tank is very deep. It's two stories uh, tall and it's 70,000 gallons of water. So I think it's much easier getting a fish into the exhibit rather than trying to get a fish out of the exhibit. And why might we want to take a fish out? Well, sometimes a fish might need to go see the doctor or sometimes the fish might need to have its annual medical checkup. Just like we have annual physicals so to make sure that we are happy and healthy. Uh, our fish and many of our animals also get these same types of physicals. So you can imagine when it's time for our giant black sea bass to have her physical. 
it is a challenge. <laughs> That's a great question. Let's see. I feel like this might be a joke, but I don't know. Alex, who's three, Rachel is asking us, but Alex, hello, is three from St. Louis, wants to know, what do octopuses and sea turtles say? I think they say this. <laughs> <laughs> I have not heard our octopuses make any noise except for a whoosh of water when she decides to jet water at one of us. Um, and the sea turtles, they can make some kind of like grunting noises, but I haven't heard our girls say too much. Caitlin, have you heard a sea turtle make a noise before? I haven't heard them make a noise, but a lot of animals communicate in other ways. So like yes, our octopus definitely. can change colors and can change the texture of their skin. So that's one way they might communicate with one another or other animals. Um, and yeah, our sea turtle, it's kind of, you know, big and slow moving. So I'm not really sure how they would communicate, um, you know, yeah. <laughs> with, with their noises. I don't know what noises they have. <laughs> yeah, and I think in the wild, I've seen um, sea turtles, they will kind of posture at each other. So they might, you know, do the equivalent of standing tall or kind of act a little shy um, to other sea turtles in the area. But our loggerhead sea turtle that we have, unfortunately we can't show her here right now because she's in a different exhibit, but she um, is usually alone in the wild. So she is usually a solitary animal who's swimming around. So she doesn't talk to too many sea turtles. But something that's really cool that's related to your question is that many of the fish in our giant kelp forest do make noise and they make things like clicks and grunts and things like that and what's cool is that we actually had some script scientists who were studying the sounds that fish make in the giant kelp forest. And what they wanted to do is they wanted to figure out the different sounds that each individual fish makes and then leave underwater my hydrophones, their microphones underwater, a hydrophone in the kelp forest so they could just listen and figure out who lived there. So those scientists from Scripps Oceanography put a big stack of those hydrophones or those underwater microscope or my oh my gosh underwater microphones in our exhibit and they were able to listen to our kelp forest animals and test that equipment and then when they were ready and they said okay it works perfectly we know what these different fish are saying underwater whether it's a click or a grunt or a pop sort of noise and then they took that equipment and put it out into the ocean into the marine protected areas here in La Jolla and they were able to listen to the wild fish and figure out what species were there. Ooh, the sea bass is coming down. Sorry, I'm really excited. <laughs> Look at her go. It's fun to see sometimes, uh, sometimes during the year she has big splotchy spots on her body. It's kind of hard to see in the glare with the light there. Pretty cool. Oh, Mary asked, is all that light natural? Yeah, we mentioned this exhibit is open to the surface of the water. And also um, some of our other exhibits are also open to the surface, like our tide pools. And we also have skylights over a bunch of them, right, Kaylin? Yeah, we have yeah. like our sea turtle tank has this big skylight over it. So that's also an all natural light that she's receiving too. Yeah, and, and light is a very important thing for many are different of our different animals. Uh, for example, we opened a year ago now, well, a year ago in May, our new sea dragons and seahorses exhibit. And one of the important things we put in that exhibit was a special lighting system so that the sea dragons would be able to have very natural light throughout the day. So even though the lights are on computers, we can change not only the day length, like how the days are shorter in the winter and longer in the summer, but we can also change uh, like how dim or dark they get at night so that the sea dragons aren't in total darkness. That's a really cool exhibit. Have you seen the lights change in there, Caitlin? Yeah, it's really awesome. It's fun to see it like early in the morning before we open um, because they you know, will dim first and then slowly get brighter for them, which is really cool. Yeah, yeah. very neat. Yeah, and let us know if you've ever been down there in, in the morning. So hopefully we'll all be able to head back there soon. I'm just looking to see if anybody guessed in the comments what our sneaky tool is that our aquarist used. And I didn't see anybody guess. You guys got to go check out our Instagram. Uh, but Caitlin, tell us what that cool tool is that our aquarists like to use. It's a turkey baster. A turkey baster. 
<laughs> yeah, they're really efficient. Um, you know, you know, you can suck up little tiny things. Um, our aquarists will use it for a wide variety of things from getting eggs to even picking up baby seahorses. And it, it's uh, great because it doesn't damage um, like the surface of the egg or the seahorse babies um, or the even the, you know, fry the little baby fish. Um, it won't hurt them because you're sucking them up and they never have to be out of water. So when you suck them up in there, there's still water in there. So that's really cool. Yeah, and it, and it gives what much more control than you think a turkey baster would have for those tiny animals. Yeah, very cool. They, they like the big ones, you know. Those are the ones that you can get a lot at once. Yeah, Otherwise, right. You can be there all day. <laughs> we when we're open, we have behind the scenes tours that take people back to our seahorse breeding room. We have been breeding seahorses for more than twenty five years. Caitlin, I forget. Do you ever lead those tours? Yeah, I do, yeah, and they're you know really about that fun. Room? You know, seahorse area. You you feel like you're really, you know, underwater with them, which is really cool. And you can see all the brand new babies because that's where they go and they're born. And it's just it's the cutest thing in the whole world just to watch those little babies float around. And it's really cool getting to give those tours because I get to see those babies kind of grow up and and um, either go on to, you know, to other zoos and aquariums or to stay here with us and go out on exhibit, which is really exciting and and really a cool thing to see. Yeah, we're yeah. really proud of that that breeding program because uh, it's been around for more than 20 years with Birch Aquarium and we have bred thousands and thousands of baby seahorses to share with other aquariums around the country. And as Caitlin was mentioning before, being part of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums means that we also contribute to the species survival plans, which is a fancy word for a plan for how we're going to keep track of all of these animals in captivity and make sure we're breeding them appropriately so that we can potentially help wild populations in the future. This is because some types of seahorses are unfortunately, their numbers are much lower than they used to be because of people taking them out for of the oceans and up from their habitats for things like the medicine trade, uh, thinking that they're good for, for traditional medicines or for the aquarium trade. And many populations of seahorses are much lower than they used to be. But by working with other zoos and aquariums through the Association of Zoos and Aquariums and contributing to that big species survival plan where we're all working together to try to save those seahorses, we're, we're able to be successful and hopefully be able to put some of those babies back out in the wild one day. It's really cool. You have a favorite type of seahorse we have in the back. I love our local species. So the local species is like the Pacific seahorse. And it's, yeah, it's so big and usually it's bright yellow, but seahorses, they can change color, but it's usually bright yellow and it can get over a foot long. It's huge, huge and beautiful. I love them. Yeah, the giant Pacific seahorses were at the Northern end of their range. They can be found pretty much from San Diego south so it's really amazing that we have them and i've i have never seen one in the wild i don't know if you've seen one in the wild caitlin but i've heard that there are some places in san diego bay or even mission bay that you can find them and they really love the seagrass beds that grow in the calm waters in the bays so if you're someone who scuba dives in the bays keep an eye out for those let's see you guys have some fun thing oh caroline hi caroline caroline loves seeing the eels swim around we do too uh, let's see, Mary Chen has a question. How many sea basses are there? Well, we only have one giant sea bass in this exhibit, but Caitlin, did you see before we, we had to work from home, the baby black sea bass that we had? Oh my gosh, it's so cute. Yeah, it's it's a, it's very tiny right now. It's it's brown and has white spots. Oh, so cute. But yeah, it you know, that teeny tiny baby is gonna grow up to be three, 400 pounds and yeah, it's going to be really exciting to get to watch her grow. Yeah, we're so excited. I feel like that baby giant black sea bass is kind of like the fish equivalent of a puppy because right now its pectoral fins or the fins on its side are gigantic, the same way a puppy has giant paws. And we're really proud to have that baby giant black sea bass. I think we have one 
out front in the Hall of Fishes. And then we have a second one that's behind the scenes in our, in our behind the scenes holding area. And what's really amazing is that some of our colleagues who are affiliated with uh, the aquarium up in San Pedro and UC Riverside have been working for many, many years to try to breed the giant black sea bass, which is an endangered species in captivity. And they were finally successful. So some of the babies that we have right now, well, both of them were from that successful captive breeding attempt. So that was really cool. We're really proud of them and working with them um, that they're able to do that. Oh man, looks like we have two really good questions coming in from Mary. She wants to know how big are seahorse babies? That comes from Nolan. Hi, Nolan. How big are seahorse babies? That's a really good question. And um, for almost all of the species, it's very similar. Um, they're going to be about the size of your pinky fingernail. So they're very tiny, maybe even a little smaller sometimes. So they're really small. Um, and then they kind of just like float around at the mercy of the ocean currents. Um, their tails aren't super great, great at hitching or latching onto anything yet. So adult seahorses, they have prehensile tails so they can latch onto things. Um, so that's really awesome that we get to see them. So we have them in round tanks that have a circular flow um, that allows them just to kind of float in the middle that way that they don't have to try to latch onto anything or get stuck in any corners. Yeah, and they're really cute. Hopefully you guys will be able to visit when we're all able to go back and see those baby seahorses. And actually, we had a blog post that is either coming up or going to go up soon that does have a video of some of those teeny tiny baby seahorses that Caitlin's talking about. They are so cute. Let's see. There was a second question that was coming in from Abigail from Mary. Are seahorses mammals? Seahorse is kind of a confusing name at times. <laughs> what do you think, Caitlin? It is a really confusing name, but they're um, not horses and they're not mammals. They're actually just fish. They're just fish that look a little funny. So um, they're kind of vertically oriented instead of side to side like regular fish. Um, and instead of having a tail fin like normal fish do, they have that prehensile tail. So it's easy to get confused because they're they look so weird and they kind of look like horses, right? They have that face, that long face, um, but they're just fish. They're just very special, beautiful fish. They are very cool fish and they have gills like other fish and they have fins on their back like other fish and their heart has two parts to their heart. Our heart inside has four parts, but fish have two parts in their heart. So those guys are definitely true fish. Those are great questions, you guys. Let's see. Oh, Gina has a really sweet question. Are the fish nice? What do you think, Kayla? <laughs> yeah, so a lot of our fish actually are really nice. So our um, aquarist will dive into this tank a couple times a week um, to feed them and to clean the tank. And sometimes for special occasions, like to collect those eggs and the fish will swim all around them. So you sometimes the horn sharks will swim up to our aquarist for a nice good scratch or a pat. Um, and then sometimes the fish really are excited about the food. So they'll just kind of go ahead and they flash or rub up against, you know, the Aquarius just to show them their excitement and to get a snack. So yeah, fish can be nice too. Yeah. And I think also is I can be, I'm surprised every day. I feel like I learn new things from our Aquarius team and that a lot of the fish can have personalities as well. They can have a grumpy day, some of them, or they can have a more friendly day, just like we could have. So um, even though fish and people are different, sometimes they can act in similar ways. And one of my favorite creatures that is very nice and she's very funny is actually not a fish, but it's our giant Pacific octopus. Octopus are invertebrates. They're not, they're not fish. They're mollusks. They're related to things like uh, squid and cuttlefish and other cephalopods, which means head foot. Very cool. But our octopus, she has quite the personality and she definitely uh, sometimes has days where she feels like coming over to play with the Aquarius team or anybody who's back there. Uh, every single day she has to have some sort of enrichment or play time to keep her really smart brain 
activated. But also some days she's like, I don't feel like talking to you. And some days she can even be a little bit mischievous. So she'll come over, she'll act like she's being really nice. And then she'll squirt water at you with her siphon. And I am convinced she's like giggling to herself. <laughs> So though not a fish, many of our animals have some pretty fun personalities. Let's see. I saw a question a little bit further up that I want to go back and find. That was a question about two of the types of sharks that we have in this exhibit. Here we go. Allison, what do the horn sharks and the leopard sharks eat? So we have, that's two of the three types of sharks in this exhibit. Maybe Caitlin, do you want to tell us about the three types of sharks that we have in our giant kelp forest? Yeah, so we have horn sharks and leopard sharks, like you mentioned, and we also have swell sharks. Um, so the leopard sharks are the bigger one. It's actually swimming across the front right now. Um, they have kind of those saddle-like patterns, those dark patterns um, on their backs, and they're really awesome. They can reach about six feet, so it's pretty big for a shark, um, for one of our sharks but their mouths are really tiny and at the bottom of their faces. So you'll see them out in the wild cruising along the bottom and just kind of resting and chilling. And so they actually will eat squishy things like squid or sometimes they'll eat crabs or things that are found on the bottom of the ocean as well. And so um, they eat very small things. And then our swell sharks and our horn sharks, which thanks guys, you're swimming right across yeah, the front. Yeah, they swim right up. Yeah. <laughs> doing me a favor. Um, so they're actually even smaller. So they're only three to four feet, which is pretty tiny and they're really cute. Um, and so they'll eat smaller fish and smaller chunks of fish. So the ours get fed um, from our aquarists. And like I said, sometimes they like to come up and get an extra snack by getting a pet or coming up to see whoever's feeding. Yeah, they're yeah. really cool. Really cool. And sometimes our aquarists, when they go into the exhibit to feed the animals, they also do cleaning when they're in that exhibit. And sometimes they'll actually find the eggs from the horn sharks and the swell sharks. And if those eggs are viable or if they've been fertilized, we'll grow them up behind the scenes or in our nursery exhibit and have some baby sharks. So it's pretty fun to see those little baby sharks growing. If you wanna see a little bit more about those baby sharks, we did a really fun one of these live kelp cams uh, last week, two weekends ago, uh, over the Easter holiday weekend when we had Scuba Bunny go in and we showed what those shark egg cases look like. So if you're curious and wanna see a little bit more about those shark eggs, check out that video, it's really fun. Let's see, we got a couple of other really great questions. Oh, Linda got a membership for Christmas and can't wait to use it. Well, congratulations, Linda. We can't wait to welcome you back to Birch Aquarium. And if there are any other members who are watching, please know that we are extending the memberships uh, for the period in which we're closed. We're gonna be extending everybody's memberships. And we're also selling gift memberships right now. So that's a really fun way to support the aquarium for uh, buying a gift for someone now, which will be a really fun experience gift in the future. So thanks for being a member. Oh, there's some other people I want to say thank you to while we're on right now. It is actually National Volunteer Week. We love our volunteers at the aquarium. At any day that anybody comes to visit us, we have many volunteers both in the front of house and behind the scenes helping our aquarist team and even in our classrooms. Uh, we have more than 500 volunteers who are going with us each year and they their time is invaluable and their help is invaluable and we really love working with, with them. So you'll see some volunteer appreciation posts on social media coming up. And I think our volunteer, Richard, who I've worked with many times, he's so great. Caitlin, have you met Richard before? I definitely yeah. have. Yeah, we love I Richard. He's the best and he is at the aquarium more than anyone else. I think he clocked seven hundred volunteer hours in 2019. So huge thank you to Richard and huge props to our team of volunteers who come and help us and help make Birch Aquarium what it is today. I can't wait to see all of them when we're back. Oh man. Uh, let's see. Oh, someone wants to know, and I don't know if they're trolling us or not, but if they can watch the video with us out us talking. Yes, you can. You can tune in on our kelp cam anytime, 24 hours a day at aquarium.ucsd.edu. And you will not see our smiling faces. You'll just have the lovely zen of the kelp cam. Let's see. Oh, Mary has another question from Abigail. Do you have fish with bioluminescence or that glowing stuff? 
<laughs> do we? Do we? I we probably do. We have. I know that we have um, jellyfish that can, but those aren't actually fish. You know, they're mm -hmm. jellyfish, so they're a little different. But they, some of them, can bioluminesce. Um, I'm not sure. Do you know if we have any specific fish that? But luminous. I know we have some that fluoresce, which means that just when you shine a certain light on them, they kind of glow or shimmer. Yeah. But I don't know about bioluminous. So anyone who visited Birch Aquarium uh, maybe two or three years ago, we had a really cool exhibit that was called um, the Infinity Cube that highlighted bioluminescence or light that is created by creatures uh, in this really cool art exhibit. And so part of that exhibit we did have some samples of preserved fish that were ones that did bioluminesce or light up now many of the animals that bioluminesce live in the open ocean or the deep ocean in places where oh hey kaylee, Hi, kaylee. <laughs> coming in hot i didn't know the boccaccio did but many fish live in the open ocean do bioluminesce and fluoresce as a way to communicate with each other as well as a way to perhaps startle predators or warn other animals to go away uh, or to come towards them. Sometimes they use it as like a bait. Uh, but we just had one of our aquarists pop in and she said the boccaccio, which is one of my favorite types of fish because it's fun to say boccaccio, does bioluminesce. That's cool. Also, and the weedy, do the weedy sea dragons bioluminesce or biofluoresce? I this think they fluoresce. I think they might biofluoresce. And as Caitlin was mentioning, there's a difference between bioluminesce and biofluoresce. Guys, we're turning it into a biology lesson. <laughs> you want to tell the difference to everyone again, Caitlin? So bioluminescence is when an animal can create its own light. Um, and then biofluorescence is when if you shine a spe specific light on the fish or the animal, that then it shines that light or glows or something like that. Right, right, right. It's very cool. And it's definitely worth watching um, if you've ever seen some of the episodes of Blue Planet or Planet Earth. They have some really amazing footage on there to see and some of it's computer, but a lot of it is is natural, which is really neat to see. Let's see here. Oh, volunteers are the best. Thanks for those props, guys. Oh, here's a good question. Maybe this question stems from some home aquarium experience. Can you put snails in the fish tanks to help clean the tanks? So our snails actually do a really good job of cleaning up. That's, you know, one of their biggest functions other than being super cute. Um, and then they have a really cool um, tongue. It's called a radula. Um, and it kind of looks like like a tongue, but it can kind of move um, back and forth in a circular pattern and it has little scrapers on it. So just like maybe your cat's tongue is really rough at home, um, our snail's tongues, they're rough too. And and these radula, they that's what they do. They scrape things off of rocks. They like to eat algae and, and um, detritus stuff like off the bottom of the, of the tanks. And so they'll scrape those off. And sometimes if the tank wall is a little dirty or has a little bit of algae on it, you can see their cute little tongue marks on there, which is really cute. Yeah, I've definitely seen the abalone in our Pacific Northwest exhibits. Sometimes they'll be sucked onto the glass and they're technically a type of snail in abalone. And you can see that funny looking radula eating up the algae on the, on the acrylic on the, what looks like glass in the front. I have seen some turban snail shells in our giant kelp forest or in a few of our other exhibits, but you have to keep in mind that snails sometimes are a great snack for other animals. And so sometimes we can't keep them in the exhibits because even though they have that hard shell on the outside, there are many types of fish that are able to open them up and eat them. So, so yes, sometimes we do. And sometimes we can't quite keep them in there. All right, guys, so we have about five more minutes that we're going to be on to talk with you guys. So please ask us a few more questions. I also wanted to let you know that we're going to have a very special uh, another one of these tomorrow. It is actually not kelp cam themed. Da, da, da. For Earth Day tomorrow, we are going to have our aquarist Fernando on. And Fernando is one of our senior animal care aquarists. And he has some really amazing experience when it comes to 
studying coral and also growing coral up here at Birch Aquarium. He's worked at the aquarium. We'll have to ask him how many years he's worked with us, but he's been with us since before we were at this location. So my guess is 27 years, close to 30 years. So we'll have to ask Fernando. You guys can help us ask tomorrow. But we're going to be on with Fernando tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., I believe. And he's going to be able to talk about coral conservation, give you a little bit of a behind the scenes look at our coral propagation program, just like we breed seahorses and sea dragons and baby fish. Uh, we also have corals we produce behind the scenes. And we also sometimes work with Scripps Institution of Oceanography scientists on helping understand how coral is adapting to our changing planet and things like that. So uh, we've got the link in the comments for you guys, or just tune in on our, our Facebook Live tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Pacific time, San Diego time. And we'll have Fernando talking about coral. We have some really fun photos of coral from behind the scenes at Birch Aquarium. And then hopefully from one of his research trips to Curacao, which is a very cool place to study coral and things like that. So I really encourage you guys to tune in. It'll be a fun way to spend Earth Day morning uh, from home to hear about coral from Fernando. Very cool. So let's see, do you guys have any more questions for you? Uh, let's see, oh, Kristen has one more question. What do your fish eat? And I think we can maybe just talk about this exhibit, our giant kelp forest, because we have like more than 6,000 different creatures at the aquarium, so that'd be a long lunch list. Um, <laughs> Caitlin, do you know what the guys in this exhibit usually like to eat? Yeah, so um, the in this aquarium, obviously you can see there's a lot of different animals and they're all different sizes. So maybe you have some of the smaller fish down at the bottom, like the Garibaldi, um, and some of our larger fish, um, maybe up at the top, even like our giant black sea bass. And so um, it's what's really awesome is that our aquarist actually will jump in there with them a couple times a week and we'll actually feed them a wide variety of food. And so our giant black sea bass will get whole food fish like mackerel. Um, and then sometimes they'll cut up little mackerel, they'll cut up squid or capelin, which are like little fish that you might have seen at like a dolphin show or something like that. Um, and even clam tongue and they'll chop all of those up into smaller pieces. Um, and then sometimes they'll even have little bits of krill and stuff like that for the really small. Um, and then they will kind of broadcast feed, which is whenever they throw a bunch into the water um, to get all the little fish at the bottom fed and excited. And then they'll start feeding individually to make sure that everybody gets fed and everybody's nice and happy, especially that big black sea bass because she really likes those mackerel. Yeah, it's really fun. And sometimes we are able to time with our aquarists for when they're gonna be feeding in the giant kelp forest exhibit. But these days, their schedules are a little bit different than they usually are. So it's hard to pin down an exact time that they're gonna be able to do the feedings. They're practicing social distancing. We actually have two different Aquarius teams who barely overlap, uh, which is a standard practice these days for members of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. Anyway, well, that was a great question to, to end with. I really wanna say thank you, Caitlin. To, for being on and, and talking about our giant kelp forest with everybody. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're happy to have more than just me talking to people. So <laughs> really, really great to welcome you. And I'm sure we'll be able to, to chat uh, with you guys again soon with Caitlin. Uh, so please, I hope you can tune in tomorrow, Wednesday at 10 a.m. Pacific time to talk about corals. And then we will be back uh, with another special guest on Thursday at two to talk about our giant kelp forest and, and chat about the ocean world with you guys. So thank you so much to Caitlin, to all of you for tuning in and for asking us your great questions. And we'll see you tomorrow.